Good evening, Dr. Shah, and thank you very much for you know making time to go over these questions which were uh, the, uh, asked uh, on the survey. Uh, so the first question is: Do psychotic episodes cause brain damage and bring on more psychotic breaks? So to answer that question, um, uh, the psychotic uh, illnesses, chronic psychotic illnesses such as schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, they are associated with some cognitive deficits as well. Cognitive problems are a symptom of uh, that illness apart from the hallucinations and paranoid delusions or such. So um, the data some uh, suggests that a first episode of psychosis, untreated first episode of psychosis can actually cause a loss of brain volume up to 1%. So uh, it is very important to get early treatment mm -hmm. and more the episodes uh, and more it's uh, left untreated, yes, there can be a possibility of uh, uh, some structural brain damage as uh, we know, you know, um, patients mm -hmm. with schizophrenia or uh, chronic psychotic disorders, they do show some Brain scan, brain scan changes like enlarged ventricles, uh, reflective of loss of brain volume. So yes, that can happen. However, it's not inevitable. So the key here is to get early diagnosis and early treatment to prevent uh, such brain damage. And uh, so early initiation of treatment with therapy, with antipsychotic medications, and omega-3 fatty acid can be neuroprotective. Thank you. The second question is, how do you help your patients understand or deal with medication versus the high they enjoy from substance use? So uh, most of the psychotropic medications are not addicting, not habit forming, and hence will not give them that high that they enjoy from substance abuse. Uh, uh, exceptions being some benzodiazepines or psychostimulants such as Adderall and such. Um, it's, uh, it's important for them to know that uh, the high that they get from the substance abuse is only temporary and the more they keep on abusing the substance, their mm -hmm. body is going to develop tolerance so that the same amount that brought them the high in initially is not going to be enough. So the body requires more and more to get that high and that's how the whole addiction process goes and uh, you know ultimately um, substances such as alcohol or such as central nervous system depression so ultimately they cause more depression um, and uh, others such as cocaine they also have long then um, ultimately um, side uh, uh, you know psychiatric mm -hmm. uh, symptoms they can cause psychiatric symptoms as well as uh, physical uh, problems. So uh, abusing substances is um, uh, it, it should be discouraged and uh, uh, you know medications mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know proper treatment of the underlying psychiatric uh, illness is warranted. Okay, thank you. Um, next question regarding Tardive dyskinesia, can it happen with a somewhat lower dosage? Is it more likely with higher dosages? My family member just reduced risperidone for this fear. He was on three milligrams two times a day and just lowered to two milligrams two times a day. So uh, tardive dyskinesia, unfortunately, are involuntary movements that can happen uh, at any dosage range. Of course, more the likelihood to happen at a higher dose. And if it happens, then yes, uh, the dose may be, uh, you try to reduce the dose. However, uh, each 
case, each individual case is different. So you have to weigh the risk versus benefits. So mm -hmm. if the dose is reduced, which ideally I would like to do that, but then sometimes that may precipitate a relapse. So we have to be very careful, evaluate the risk benefits, evaluate the whole picture. It can happen at any dosage range. Um, however, now these days, there are a couple of medications available to help with such tardive dyskinesias. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, you know, I would encourage you to discuss this with your um, psychiatrist, what your fear is, if the fear is that from Risperdal, you may get tardive dyskinesias. You may want to consider a switch to something else, but then of course, again, it all depends and your psychiatrist would know the best because they know your case history and everything and uh, would advise you the best. Thank you. Uh, next question. My daughter is taking Zoloft for OCD for more than four years. Any information on magic mushrooms, ketamine, would they be helpful for OCD? Are there any studies going on with these things? So um, magic mushroom is uh, psilocybin. It's a hallucinogenic uh, substance. It's a schedule one substance, meaning it has very high potential for abuse. And there is no um, uh, known or uh, say approved uh, medical use uh, mm -hmm. uh, for the substance. Uh, there are some research has been done, some research on it shows that uh, those patients with advanced cancer, uh, some of those patients have this kind of existential distress, like uh, meaning like they feel like life has no meaning to it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so for those patients uh, 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 psilocybin showed some promising result like uh, they had relief with such uh, a symptom of existential distress however at this point uh, there is no approved medical uh, usage for the substance uh, not much data at all for OCD and it's a hallucinogen, it can cause, uh, as the name suggests, psychosis, um, as well as uh, medical issues. So um, I would advise, uh, you know, uh, not to uh, consider such an uh, option. Ketamine, there are controversial reports. Ketamine has uh, actually has been approved now for treatment resistant depression. And there are some reports that it may help for OCD as well. Um, for OCD, there are several uh, options. Of course, the SSRIs these days are the first drug of choice, like you are on Zoloft. So that is SSRI. Another one with a good report is clomipramine, which is a tricyclic antidepressant. Mm -hmm. And then uh, other combination antidepressants have been used. Also augmentation with uh, uh, some uh, low-dose antipsychotic has been uh, used, such as, especially such as Abilify. And there are many others that have been studied. Um, uh, one of the articles says um, uh, 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 there is some documented benefits when uh, used along with SSRI like Zoloft or such uh, for medications such as Namenda and Lamicta. Namenda is a dementia medication and it has it it may show some benefit just because of its mechanism of action may show some benefit for ocd symptoms also lamictal which is uh, mainly used as a mood stabilizer for bipolar disorder may show some benefit then the mixed results there are mixed results with usage of a medicine called topamax and acetylcysteine and ketamine so ketamine falls in mm -hmm. that category and uh, in the initial phase is a medication like uh, uh, cyclosirin may help. So, uh, so overall, to summarize, I guess ketamine uh, does have some uh, reports, but it's still controversial and more research uh, needs to be done. Thank you. Next question. How does prolonged use of Invega 
affect the elderly population? And here the uh, person who's asking you the question mentions that it is a, uh, the individual is 85 plus. Okay, so I mean, um, Invega is an antipsychotic and um, uh, all antipsychotics can have uh, uh, possibility of uh, causing uh, Parkinson kind of side effects, tremors, involuntary movements such as tardive dyskinesias. Elderly may be a little more prone to such side effects. Uh, also, with elderly, sometimes elderly people have a reduced uh, kidney function, and Invega does uh, go through kidneys to get cleared. So, uh, those with uh, kidney uh, impairment may uh, the dose needs to be adjusted. It may need to be reduced. Um, so, these are a couple of uh, things, and. Um, uh, of if in Vega or for that matter, any antipsychotics that are being used in elderly patients who may have dementia related psychosis, it's, uh, it's not FDA approved use and uh, studies have shown some increased risk of mortality and cerebrovascular events such as stroke. Uh, and this is not just for in Vega, it's for all antipsychotics in general for elderly mm -hmm people with dementia related psychosis. Thank you. The next question, does constant changes in medications do permanent damage to the brain, muscle movements and cognitive decline? Um, that's, uh, um, I mean, uh, it all depends what do you exactly mean by constant change of medication because um, ideally, if a certain medication is working, then there's no need for change. So, uh, but some medications do have some mild, minor cognitive side effects, even some antidepressants, but it does not seem to cause like, you know, uh, dementia on, uh, down the road, dementia or such uh, permanent uh, progressive, mm -hmm. uh, you know, cognitive problems. Okay, thank you. Next question, can Benadryl help alleviate tremors that occur with clozapine use? If yes, can my son take it daily in a non-drowsy form for this? I mean, it's not clear what does she mean by for this. Yeah, so Benadryl is an antihistamine. We use it all the time. I guess all of us may have used it sometime during our uh, life uh, so for allergies or such. Um, so it is an antihistamine. It is very useful. Benadryl and cogentin, uh, another medicine is cogentin, benstropin. Those two are very useful to reverse the antipsychotic side effect of acute dystonia. That's a muscle, uh, uh, um, it, 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 acute dystonia is like muscle tightness, you know, the jaw sometimes gets locked, uh, tongue mm -hmm. gets, uh, 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 tongue gets enlarged, so therefore they may have trouble speaking, trouble swallowing, such, such things. Um, the IM injection of Benadryl is very useful in uh, uh, reversing such side effect. Tremors, um, it, it may be useful, although cogentin may be better for such, but because all antihistamines also have some anticholinergic properties, Benadryl may help. However, it's mainly the data is for Benadryl. So if you are going to substitute, and Benadryl is sedating. It is a sedating antihistamine. So if you are going to substitute it for non-sedating, such as Zyrtec, Allegra, uh, those are mainly for allergies and don't have much data for uh, uh, for uh, its benefit with such side effects from psychotropic medications like tremors. Mm -hmm. Thank you, doctor. Um, the next question, when switching from one injectable to another, is there a transition period? And how is the change made? So... Uh, 
it all uh, so it depends uh, what exactly the question inject from one long acting injectable to another long acting injectable a different medicine or such as invega for example has a monthly injection called invega sustena which is to be given every month and then you may switch from that to a three month injection same in way it is called invega trinza so from invega sustena you can switch to invega trinza which makes life easier it's just once every three months so for switch like that uh, you cannot be on oral invega only the oral invega to be placed on a three monthly injection of invega trinza you have to have uh, taken invega sustena the monthly injection uh, for uh, i think it is for like couple of doses three months or so and then switch to trinza uh, that's for the invega if if you need to switch from say um, um, invega injection to say abilify monthly injection or from haldol monthly injection to invega injection such a change from one medicine to another medicine uh usually uh, you know you should do it at the time when the next dose is due so say for example uh, you took haldol decanoate injection today and you wish to make the change you should talk to your doctor and it should be targeted to the next injection it should be targeted towards the whatever your next so that today is our august 20 so it should be targeted somewhere around september 20 and it should not be like if you are planning to switch you should first try the oral medicine because once the injection is given of course first of all it takes a while to build up in the system another is uh, if you get any side effects or anything it's going to be prolonged because it's in mm -hmm. the injectable form mm -hmm. so you need to switch to oral first and then uh, take the uh, 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 that injection uh, but it's to be usually to be taken around the time when the next dose is due of the previous injection mm -hmm. thank you uh, this question is a rather a long one so please bear with me we are experiencing confusion about clozapine My 56-year-old daughter developed dementia-like symptoms after being on it for four and a half years. She was then weaned off it and put back on her requested medication. Her doctor stopped it, and she went back on Seroquel, which is, as in the past, has led to her present hospitalization. She had been often hospitalized in the past until she went on clozapine in July of 2015. That was the longest time between hospitalization, five years. Should she go back on it? It has caused her dullness, but at least she's kept out of the hospital for five years until now. She's been diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder and bipolar. okay so to answer that question first of all i would not uh, make any recommendation for or against changing the current medication because i don't know her case history that well so of course it needs to be taken up to with her psychiatrist uh, all antipsychotic medication or for that matter as i said even some antidepressant medication can sometimes cause some minor uh, cognitive side effects however one thing important to keep in mind is people with schizoaffective or schizophrenia disorders they do have cognitive symptoms as a part of the underlying uh, uh, psychotic illness so whether clozapine cause those cognitive side effects uh, or not uh, of course that can only be answered say she started clozapine and then started having all the cognitive problems then probably it is from that however clozapine is a, it's a very good medicine for treatment refractory uh, uh, um, uh, schizophrenia uh, it has good data 
it has it does keep people out of hospitalizations so it does have some good data and actually some data even suggests that these uh, newer and uh, antipsychotics especially clozadil may actually even um benefit some of the cognitive symptoms mm -hmm. that uh, patients with schizophrenia have uh, however having said that uh, i'm i'm not uh, disputing or i'm not saying that clozadil may not have caused her cognitive side effects um so now if she is on seroquel and obviously it seems like it's not working as well and uh, requiring hospitalization this is something very important that needs to be taken up with her psychiatrist and uh, you know sometimes um, the doctor may need to just educate her uh, uh, and uh, make her see what you know like uh, it's probably not the medication that's causing cognitive side effects probably it's the cognitive uh, problems are a part of her illness and such so um, yeah, please uh, mm -hmm. consult with the psychiatrist. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Next question is um, regarding to use of Adderall for depression. Are there any ongoing research on gene therapy, epigenetic research for treatment resistant depression? So Adderall is a psychostimulant and all psychostimulants may uh, some, uh, sometimes help with very refractory depression, um, more so than Adderall. Uh, I have uh, very rarely used uh, Ritalin, such medicine Ritalin is also a psychostimulant, uh, especially that kind of depression, which has uh, very, um, you know, uh, symptoms of apathy, a lack of motivation, uh, extreme tiredness, uh, sleepiness, that kind of, uh, because uh, this is a psychostimulant, it may help with uh, uh, depression. Although it is not a first drug of choice, it's only reserved uh, for uh, people who may have failed uh, trials of antidepressants um, <clears throat> and symptoms are quite severe. So, uh, and having said that, uh, you know, uh, with the uh, psychostimulants, there can be sometimes some cardiac side effects. So all that needs to be, the risk benefits needs to be weighed and uh, your psychiatrist can help you decide uh, if that is a good choice indeed. Uh, about the genes and epigenetic research, uh, there is quite a bit of uh, research going on. However, at this point, um, there is no, uh, the, the last APA task force uh, said about the genes, uh, genetic testing, which uh, some people, some patients get tempted to get that genetic testing done, um, that uh, some uh, genetic uh, uh, testing companies offer. They give you a uh, a report uh, of your liver enzyme, which is called cytochrome B450 liver enzyme, whether you may, how you metabolize the antidepressants. Um, some people uh, by their genetic constitution, some people are poor metabolizers, some people are intermediate metabolizers, some people are rapid metabolizers. So they give you a breakdown report of each and every antidepressant whether how you are metabolizing that particular medicine and uh, that may help uh, decide uh, like which medicine to try. However, uh, the a APA task force has uh, uh, reviewed all that literature uh, and has uh, said that um, the evidence is insufficient to recommend such genetic testing as a routine or even uh, as um, on a widespread basis. And it has not, the results uh, if, uh, have not uh, showed much uh, difference between the treatment that is, um, uh, that is being prescribed by the psychiatrist uh, uh, without such genetic testing. So there is not much mm -hmm. A difference uh, notice. So therefore, such uh, genetic testing is not recommended at this time to 
uh, help the doctors decide which particular medication to choose uh, because they said they such uh, claims that of course the gen the companies make um, they first of all they have such claims on and their studies have been uh, uh, have had small uh, population small sample size meaning uh, not enough uh, large uh, studies and uh, uh, they, they have uh, uh, not shown much uh, difference so uh, that's the thing for the this uh, genetic testing the epigenetic research mainly epigenesis means how environmental factors contribute or modify your genetic susceptibility so um, so uh, we all know environmental factors can contribute to depression anxiety uh, psychotic disorders everything so environmental factors such as childhood trauma um, uh, serious uh, uh, life events such as loss of a loved one a divorce all these environmental factors can uh, contribute and aggravate psychiatric illnesses and that's where the research is how those um, stressful events ultimately modify our genes uh, such as uh, dna methylation uh, micro rna so those are some very technical terms but basically uh, it it may lead to some changes with in our um, uh, dna uh, without altering the DNA sequence, it leads to some changes that may make somebody more prone to uh, depression. So that's ongoing. However, there's nothing uh, kind of specific uh, uh, to, to be offered at this point to the patient population. Thank you. Next question is, uh, is it okay to take medication while pregnant? Will the child be impacted? So the decision to take medication by, uh, during pregnancy is uh, again, once again, a risk benefits issue, uh, the risk versus benefits of being on medi medication during pregnancy needs to be weighed. If somebody has had a chronic illness, whatever it may be, depression, anxiety, psychotic disorders, sometimes the benefits of being on medication outweigh the risk. Um, just because the illness itself, if not under control and if not well treated, can lead to adverse pregnancy outcomes and effects on the uh, fetus and baby. So uh, whether to use medications during pregnancy, uh, you know, you have to discuss that risk benefits with your psychiatrist. And general rule is if you, uh, if you are stable, first of all, if you are trying to conceive, please let your psychiatrist know so that if possible, if you have been stable for a while, they may want to taper you off the medication so that you are not on any medication medication while you are trying to conceive or at least during the first trimester when the organs are being formed mm -hmm. for the fetus. Uh, and thus you can avoid any malformations. Uh, however, if you need to be on such as antidepressant, most antidepressants such as SSRIs, have shown a very low risk of fetal malformation, almost uh, no, uh, not much increased risk than the general population, those who are not on antidepressants. Uh, so that's encouraging news. Uh, there may be some rip, uh, issues such as spontaneous abortion or low birth weight. Um, then there is with the antidepressants, uh, usually most of them are found to be safe with no increased risk of uh, congenital malformations or uh, any ongoing neurocognitive effects in the baby. Uh, most SSRIs seem to be okay, exception being Paxil. Paxil has, uh, is now a category D medicine. 
uh, it has some studies show, although it is controversial, but some studies have shown some cardiac defects with Paxil. So if somebody is on Paxil, I mean, you know, you should work with your psychiatrist and their OBGYN doctor. So you try to avoid that one, but otherwise usually Zoloft, Prozac, those have been, uh, you know, have much widespread data available. Um, during the third trimester, there is some, some doctors do try to taper off the medication just because in the neon newborn, there may be something, they may experience something like a withdrawal syndrome with uh, so being very um, irritable, constant crying, respiratory distress, feeding difficulties. So that has been seen. Uh, also, there is another, it is quite rare, but there is another possibility with the newborn having something called persistent pulmonary hypertension uh, when the antidepressants have continued all through the third trimester and through the delivery. What that means basically is the newborn may have uh, hypoxia and respiratory distress and sometimes it can be pretty serious and life threatening. However, it is quite rare. But we all always, like I always discuss all that with my patients and give them a choice what they would like to do. Uh, so that's some um, thing about the antidepressant use during pregnancy. Uh, somebody who may have bipolar disorder, Depakote should not be used during pregnancy. Uh, Depakote, Tegretol, those have been shown to cause neural tube side, uh, neural tube birth defects. So we try to not use those if you are on lithium. Lithium may be continued during pregnancy with high monitoring, close monitoring. Some reports are there for uh, cardiac birth defect with lithium. Um, and most uh, antipsychotics seem to be okay, um, you know, um, but then again, uh, it all comes to risk versus benefits. And as far as possible, you try to avoid the during the first trimester, but if somebody has a chronic history, uh, you know, sometimes the benefits do outweigh the risk. Okay, thank you. Next question, what do you mean medication sexual side effect? Oh, um, medications may, anti, most antidepressants do have the potential to cause sexual side effects. Uh, such as in males, uh, erection dysfunction, delayed ejaculation in females, uh, both in males and females, low sexual desire, and in females, delayed orgasm. So this can be potential uh, sexual side effects from medications, and that may uh, very well affect the compliance. Uh, some people are kind of reluctant to discuss this, uh, but, uh, you know, I would encourage you to discuss if you do have such side effects with your psychiatrist and see what can be done. Sometimes I may reduce the dose. Sometimes uh, some doctors add Wellbutrin, Bipropion to offset such sexual side effects. There are some newer SSRIs available that do not uh, seem to have much of these sexual side effects. So uh, that can be discussed if a switch is possible, uh, although these newer ones are quite expensive. But, uh, you know, uh, things can be done and there are options available. Thank you. Next question, medications have such terrible side effects and that is why um, lots of mentally ill patients have issues staying on medication. Are there any alternative solutions for this uh, medication or if any to help mental illness? So uh, say for example, for depression, uh, the alternative are uh, to uh, seek therapy, which can be very helpful. Of course, it's not going to help you right away. However, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy may very well help, has good data um, that it, it, it can um, uh, help with the depression. 
for anxiety disorders, also therapy for OCD exposure and prevention uh, response therapy. Uh, all, so therapy, first of all, can help. Also, there is uh, data with uh, exercise, regular exercising about 30 to 45 minutes a day, at least three days a week, uh, does improve physical as well as mental health. Uh, you may want to look into other things such as yoga, meditation that seem to help. More so with depression, anxiety, um, so these there are other alternative uh, treatments however uh, if the symptoms are quite severe and if the doctor feels like medication trial is warranted um, i would uh, i would encourage you to try it uh, yes medications can have side effects and for that matter there is no medication without any side effect for that matter even tylenol has side effects yeah. and if mm -hmm. not uh, used properly or if uh, you know uh, uh, you know overdose or something it can damage your liver and can be potentially life threatening something as simple as tylenol over the counter um, so my advice would be uh, to keep a more open mind and um, see what side effects you are concerned about, discuss them, discuss your fears about the medication with your doctor and um, see what may be the best for you. Thank you, Dr. Shah. And this brings us to the last question. Do we have new drugs in treating schizophrenia? Um, so, uh, new drugs meaning, I mean, uh, there have been new drugs such as, relatively newer drugs such as Geodone, Latuda, Raylar. Um, so, and now the most, uh, the newest one in the market is Kepleta. Although there are not much, uh, not much experience yet amongst the doctors using that medicine better because it's quite new. Um, however, the relatively newer ones like Geodone, Latuda, Raylar, uh, I myself have used them and have seen some good results. Okay, so th thank you, Dr. Shah, for incredibly detailed you know, uh, information and explanation on uh, each and every question. Uh, I really appreciate your time and grateful uh, to you for doing this extra session and taking time to go through each and every question. And I'm sure this uh, will be very helpful to our families and the person uh, who actually, uh, you know, had these questions. Have this question. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.